Good morning, people of God. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship. Good to be together. Welcome to those of you worshiping online as well as those of you in person. It's good to gather for worship. Thanks for being here. I'm Jay Hilbinger, one of the pastors of First Lutheran Church. Pastor Emily Lemoyne is greeting people on Facebook Live this morning. Please take a moment, if you are on Facebook, please take a moment to greet one another and let us know you're here. We'd appreciate you making a comment on the Facebook page. A couple of more announcements as we begin. Our annual shoe drive is underway. You probably saw that as you walked in the building. Shoes for All is back, and we are collecting shoes through October 15th. Please bring light, new, and gently used shoes to drop off at our main entrance to the office entrance A. Thanks. You'll see the cart there with a sign for the collection. Also, second announcement, mum's the word, right? Mum's the word. It's that time when our First Lutheran School for Young Children is holding their annual mum sale, and you can help support that. If you'd like some mums, please see details in last Thursday's e-news to order your mums along with deadlines. And keep in mind, I also have that information on the First Lutheran School for Young Children Facebook page as well. And finally, while our regathering is not the grand full tilt regathering we had hoped for just a few months ago, uh, we are starting some new faith formation groups for children, youth, and adults in the coming weeks, in the month of September. Uh, so please be informed, stay connected, and read the information that comes out. Uh, I will host a Bible study both in person, in the community center, and also through Zoom uh, on Thursdays, both at 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. And right now we're going to be looking at the book of James during the month of September as we continue this series together. And that'll begin Thursday, September 9th. Also, uh, there are various indoor and outdoor opportunities for children and for youth, depending on their ages, that are getting underway September 12th in two weeks, just two weeks away. So look at last Friday's First Glance newsletter that came out for the September 1 edition, and keep an eye on e-news, including this Thursday's e-news, for all the details. Our worship continues with the reconciliation the Reconciling in Christ Affirmation that's printed in your bulletin and on your screen. Please stand, join with me. On October 22, 2017, First Lutheran Church of Greensboro, North Carolina became a Reconciling in Christ community by congregational vote. Our affirmation of welcome says, recognizing that we are called by faith to embody God's unconditional love and abundant grace in challenging times, we joyfully welcome everyone into the life of First Lutheran Church. We affirm what the Apostle Paul wrote, that in Jesus Christ, the heart of God is fully revealed. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. As a Christian community, we are compelled to be God's agents of reconciliation and healing within society, embracing diversity and uniqueness. We are therefore committed to sharing God's love and Christ's mission with all people without regard to age, cultural or ethnic background, gender identity, sexual expression or sexual orientation, economic or life circumstances, physical or mental ability, family situation, spiritual beliefs, or any of the things that so often divide us. All are invited to be a part of First Lutheran Church, and all means all. Let us sing.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. God, our creator, you have made the one human family in your own image, and you have reunited us through the grace of Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
By your spirit, live within, within us to remove any arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. And work among us to break down the barriers that divide us. Unite us in bonds of peace as we strive to work together to accomplish your purposes on earth. We pray with a vision of that time when all people of every ethnicity, nation, and label serve you in harmony for the sake of love alone. Amen. You may be seated. Hi, kids. It's Kathleen and Louisiana with our children's message for this week. And I want to tell you about a cartoon that I absolutely loved when I was young. It was the Peanuts cartoon. And I wonder, you know, they're still around today. I wonder if you're familiar with some of these characters. So I've got a picture in case you aren't familiar with them. We have the character of Charlie Brown and his loyal dog Snoopy. And then there was Linus, and he carried his blanket around. There were a lot of other kids. They went to school together. They played together. They sat around talking about life together. But there's another character, not these. Another one I want to tell you about. And his name is Pigpen. Pigpen always had a cloud of dust and dirt that seemed to follow him wherever he went. And just by looking at him, you might not want to approach him because he could be dirty and smelly. But do you know what that Peanuts gang did? Absolutely nothing. They treated him like they treated everyone else. They welcomed Pigpen into their classroom and playtime and treated him just like they treated all their other friends. You know, there's a lot that we can learn from the Peanuts kids about how to treat other people, about not judging people based on what they look like. Because you know what? We don't want people judging us by what we look like either, right? And also, we shouldn't judge people on a lot of other different things. And we can learn a lot from peanuts and how they treat all the kids that they come across. We should welcome all people just like the Peanuts gang did with Pigpen. So let us pray before our service continues. Good and gracious God, we thank you for cartoons that make us laugh and for the kids in the Peanuts crew, the kids that show us how to interact with others that we come in contact with on a daily basis. Teach us not to judge others based on their appearance either, like they did with Pigman. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thanks, kids, so much for your time. I look forward to seeing you next week. A reading from the fourth chapter of James. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers and sisters. Whoever speaks evil against another or judges another speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy. So who then are you to judge your neighbor? Here is Dozer. A reading from James, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism 
really believe in our amazing Lord Jesus the Christ? For if a person wearing gold rings and fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes with no jewelry also enters, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes, saying, Have a seat here, please, while to the other who is poor you say, Stand over there or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil intent? Listen, my beloved sisters and brothers, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not the wealthier ones who drag you into court? Is it not they who dishonor the excellent name of Christ that was invoked over you? Your bottom line, your bare minimum standard, is to always and truly fulfill the royal law according to scripture, which is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. When you show partiality, you divide yourselves, and you are convinced by that same law as hopeless sinners showing no signs of remorse. In order to honor Jesus, we are to speak and to act as those who are judged solely by God's law of freely given love, the law of grace. Judgment will come without mercy to anyone who shows no mercy. Grace and mercy always triumph over judgment and disunity. The good news of God for all people Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. My wife Cindy and I resisted for a long time. We resisted that temptation, I would say, for about 10 years. But about a month ago, we finally gave in. Yes, we started watching the television series Downton Abbey. If you don't know, but you probably do, it's a British TV drama set in the early 20th century. Covers the years 1912 to 1926. The fictitious Downton Abbey is the home of the aristocratic family, the Crawleys, whose lives are affected by various real-world historical events documented along the way. What's fascinating to me, among several things, is the interplay between the wealthy aristocrats who live in the Abbey's first and second floors primarily, and then their multitude of lower class servants who work from and eat in the basement of the home while sleeping at night in the attic. Virtually every episode highlights some aspect of this struggle, England's struggle with the class system as it existed at the turn of that century, which began to break down in some ways in the early 1900s, particularly post-World War I. Early on in the series, uh, the whole family struggles with tradition of one form or another and how things are supposed to be done. Now, I don't think it's a spoiler because you've had 10 years to watch it, but, uh, but uh, the youngest Crawley daughter is Sybil, and she falls in love with the servant who is the chauffeur, and he's of Irish descent, of all things, Tom Branson. They eventually get married. Family members and servants alike take sides as this most unusual relationship even doesn't just happen, but flourishes, much to many people's surprise. How can people of such very different background and traditions possibly forge a successful marriage? And that becomes one of the themes along the way. The show constantly conveys a message that regardless of wealth, regardless of status or station, we all really want similar things in the human journey. And we all struggle mightily with suffering that life brings our way. We are so much more alike than we are different. 
This is the wisdom teaching of James in our reading for today. The wisdom of impartiality. That's a word that James uses. James deals primarily with the divisions in congregations and early Christianity between wealthy and poor. Yes, we know there were many other divisions going on in early Christianity as well. People getting caught up in the labels as Pastor Emily referred to in a children's message a moment ago. He gives a nod to what James does, gives a nod to what theologians call the preferential treatment of the poor or God's preferential regard for the poor. It's prevalent in both the Hebrew scriptures, especially in the prophets, and also in the gospel accounts of Jesus' ministry. James encourages all people of faith with this wisdom to see the human family through God's eyes. Something we've been reminded of countless times in these past 18 months, to say the least. It's become almost cliche, but we know it to be true. And it's so hard to live out. We are all in this together. Oh, how hard it is for me, for us, to truly live that reality. The wisdom of impartiality. Perhaps another way to say it is celebrating human differences and diversity as God's gift to the world. That we benefit from, that we depend on, that nourish us richly. It's something we know we must all keep working on and working at. We seem to be always on the way, but we honestly struggle and find it most difficult to arrive at our desired destination, or perhaps we should say God's desired destination for the human family. And we know, don't we, the world surely needs us, needs the body of Christ, as God does, to keep trying our best, to practice this, to live it out, and to teach the world about it. Think about how important the wisdom of impartiality is for children to learn as they grow up in their formidable years. Now, you and I know plenty of stories of very young children, toddlers, and just over toddler age where children seem to get along and play together so well without regard to appearance or station or status or all those labels we adults tend to convince ourselves are so important. But... We know that once they get into elementary years, that the world tries to teach them to get into cliques, get into those groups, and be careful about people who aren't like us. Well, this week I saw a video made by Amy, who is a third grade teacher. She's sharing how she teaches young children about the idea of fairness. Fairness. She says she hears the phrase all the time, that's not fair, you can imagine, right? And as she tries to show young children what fairness means, she talks about helping children based on their needs and not treating them all exactly the same way. So here's what she does to help children understand the importance of fairness. Maybe you've seen the TikTok uh, video that's also gone viral on Facebook and probably other places as well. She takes out a Band-Aid, an adhesive bandage, and she asks her students to raise their hands if they've ever scraped or cut or bunged up their elbow. And, of course, hands go up in the air, virtually the whole class. Well, she picks one of those children and asks that child to tell their story. And then she walks over and puts the bandage on their elbow and she says, I'm sorry you hurt your elbow. Here's a bandage to make you feel better. Next, she asks the children in her class if they've ever bumped or scraped their head. And again, hands go up. So she calls on one and asks them to tell the story about when they hurt their head. And then she goes up to that child with another bandage and she says, I'm so sorry you hurt your head. She puts that bandage on their elbow and says, here's a bandage for your elbow. I hope you feel better. Well, the children are a bit confused. And so she goes on. 
Next, she asks for the students who have bumped or scraped their knee. And of course, hands go up again. She picks one, they tell their story. And this time she takes out another bandage, goes up to that child and says, I'm so sorry you hurt your knee. Here's a bandage for your elbow. I sure hope your knee feels better. By now, she says, they start to react and ask questions. So she asks them, what's the matter? What's wrong? And when they tell her it does no good to put a bandage on the elbow for a knee or a head that's scraped or cut, she says, exactly. She goes on to explain how even though she gave every person the exact same thing, it wasn't helpful to the second two, just to the first. It wasn't what they really needed. So then they can more easily talk about things in the classroom that they say, that's not fair about. Like she can talk about the one student who is on the spectrum and needs noise-canceling headphones in order to participate in class. And one person in class who is dealing with diabetes and must have an extra snack in the afternoon. And another friend in the class who deals with ADHD and needs a fidget spinner to be able to concentrate and pay attention in class. But not everyone can have one. She reminds them of something. She says, fairness doesn't mean everyone gets the same thing. Instead, fairness means everyone gets what they need most to be cared for. Fairness means everyone gets what they truly need to succeed. Our children need to understand that impartiality and fairness means more than everyone is treated exactly the same. Because that exactly the same comes from my perspective when I look at other people, and sometimes that's not what they need most. In one of the weekly e-newsletters I get, I read the story about a pastor who just turned 30 years old. She was writing a letter to her younger self. She was writing a letter to herself as a 20-year-old. And as she wrote that letter, she wrote, In time, I have begun to understand that resurrection is God's way of working in the world. And she went on to explain that. She says, because God really does make what seems impossible, possible. She talks about Easter of this year, 2021, when she not only celebrated her first Easter as an ordained pastor, but she also presided at a baptism of a child for the first time. And in the crowd that day was her spouse who was welcomed by everyone. And the crowd was mostly in uniform because her new and first call as a pastor was as a military chaplain. And then she writes to her younger self, you see, 10 years ago, I never would have thought any of this was possible because I'm a member of the LGBT community. But with God, the impossible becomes possible. When we strive to live into the wisdom of impartiality, we may focus on how uncomfortable it makes us or how hard it is or how we'd really not rather try. But have we ever thought about how it blesses the people around us? Do we take time to see how it transforms and blesses lives and how the impossible becomes possible through us? As we conclude, let's go back to Downton Abbey for a second. A local teacher in Downton is a member of the working class, and she is talking to Tom Branson, the servant chauffeur who married into the aristocratic Crawley family. The teacher refers in a very condescending way to the Crawley family, telling Tom what she believes about those types, those rich, wealthy, aristocratic folks. And Branson is quick to reply. He says, I don't believe in types. I believe in people. May we do our best to avoid talking about those types of people and instead believe in people. As James makes it clear 
in his book of wisdom, when we show partiality, we divide the human family. And as he says, may we honor the name of Christ invoked at our baptisms so that our bottom line, our bare minimum, our standard is to strive to always fulfill the royal law according to the wisdom of Jesus, which is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Because as James reminds us, grace and mercy always triumphs over judgment and disunity. And the world needs that more than anything. In Jesus' name, amen. We join our voices as one and profess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Together we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. I just want to say a quick word of thanks and a reminder that our basket is out for the offering as you leave if you did not see it on the way in on the table where near, next to the bulletins. And for those of you at home and who are worshiping online, if you'd like to give a gift to support the mission and ministry of First Lutheran Church and you're unable to be present or come or bring that by, please look at our website and look how you can donate through the website, firstlutheran.com. Thank you so much for sustaining the mission ministry and ministry of our congregation together. Let us pray. Rooted in Christ and sustained by the Spirit, we offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all of creation. God of one and God of all, you beautify the earth with an incredible diversity of life in the plant and the animal kingdoms. We breathe deeply with gratitude as we are blessed and nourished by this diversity of the natural world that gives us life and gives us happiness. And yet we honestly struggle to accept and embrace your same creative power in the diversity of the one human family. 
Lord, as James reminds us, give us the wisdom of impartiality as we strive for peace, for understanding, and for looking at life from one another's eyes, especially those who are not just like us. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Lord of adventure, we give thanks for the rich history in our North Carolina Synod of camping ministry and our partnerships we share with Agape and Curry Beach, Camp Agape and Curry Beach, along with the camping ministries of Novus Way. We pray for your help and guidance, especially for the camps of Novus Way, including Luther Ridge and Luther Rock, as they undergo a season of leadership transition. We hold them in our prayers and we partner with them to continue to sustain a life of discipleship. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy, mercy is great. We continue to hold in our hearts and yours those who are suffering this day, this moment. Bring healing and relief, bring rescue and safety mindful of those who are enduring hurricane winds and floods, wildfires, and the horror of warfare and violence. We pray for the people of Haiti, the people of Afghanistan, the people of the Gulf Coast, and the people of the Western United States. Show us how we can help and how we can serve as your healing love in the midst of their distress. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Our frustration over the pandemic has turned to exasperation, and we continue to pray with hope and with gratitude for those who are responsible for taking part in a new academic year as it moves forward. So we lift up students and parents, teachers and school staff on every level of learning. In our thanksgiving and our humble admiration, we continue to pray for healthcare workers and first responders and all who are dealing with extra risk and working selflessly to nurture, comfort, heal and sustain lives. May they in some small way feel some strength from our prayers on their behalf. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. We are all mindful of people we wish to pray for. We take a moment to reflect on those who need your healing, comfort, and presence in their lives in special ways. We pray for the families of those who have recently died, including John McCarthy, Carol Bastian, Tony Smith, George Hessenthaler, and Earl Childress. We thank you for their lives and we pray for comfort, healing, and sustenance as their loved ones grieve. May we embody that presence and your promises that hold them. We lift up to you others that we are aware of that we wish to pray for. And so this day we pray for Lois and Debbie and B, for Rick, Marcia, Tony, Sam, for John and Judy, Cindy and Kate, Bob, Joanne, Susan, Edgar, Grace, Wanda, Charlene, and Julia. We pray for David and Ron, for Howard and Rachel. There are other people on our hearts, O oh God, we wish to lift up in prayer and hold in your heart and ours. So we take a moment now to name them, either silently or out loud. Help us, O oh God, to embody your compassion and the gift of your comforting presence. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy, mercy is great. We lift these and all our prayers to you, O oh God, confident in the promise of your saving love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Together we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please stand for the benediction and the last hymn. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and with mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being part of worship today. Now go with Christ and go as Christ to love and serve God's world. Thanks be to God.